I had four encounters with him, and I'd say the first of them was the most significant. I was in high school. I had applied to colleges. He was professor of astronomy at Cornell. Cornell was one of the schools I had applied to. And my application was just dripping with the universe because I had known since age nine that I was interested in studying the cosmos. And so I didn't know this at the time, but the admissions office forwarded my application to him for his review. He then wrote a personal letter to me. This Carl say he'd already had best-selling books, he was already famous, had been on The Tonight Show, and I'm just a 17-year-old kid from the Bronx. And I get this letter in the mail. First I couldn't believe it, and then, yeah, it was real. And he invited me up to spend a day at Cornell to decide whether or not that would be the right school I should attend. So I went. He, he met me outside his building, took me, showed me the lab. The cosmos is full beyond measure of elegant truths, of exquisite interrelationships, of the awesome machinery of nature. And the day was drawing to a close. This is Ithaca in the winter, Ithaca, New York, and it started to snow. He drove me to the bus station, said if the snow gets too heavy and the bus can't get through, here's my home number. You can stay with my family overnight. It was like, whoa, who, who is this human being? The, he had no obligation to me. He didn't know me from anything. And I thought to myself, if I am ever at remotely as important a figure as he is in my later years, that I will sure as day follows night treat students the way he treated me. As many people already know, I'm about to host and be your guide for the next generation cosmos. The original one was 34 years ago with Carl Sagan. It's an entire generation and I think frankly it's been overdue for quite some time and it's another 13 episodes. This time it'll be airing on network on Fox in prime time and for me that's the real indication that science has be is becoming mainstream. And that, that can only be a good thing, because science is how the world works. So Cosmos is, a, is in this continuing journey. We want to not only teach you a little bit of science, but leave you reflecting on why science matters. It's a common thought to imagine that for a scientist to communicate with the public, what the scientist must do is translate. And there's some of that that goes on. You know, there's a vocabulary mismatch. When you're bringing the universe down to Earth, there, you, can, you can apply various sort of filters. You say, all right, of what's scientifically interesting, what do I think, in my judgment, would the public be particularly interested in? They're not going to be interested in all of it, but a subset they will be. And you know how I know? Uh, I've tested you. In my Twitter stream, I put out biscuits, and I watch to see how many people reply, or respond, or are excited, or retweet. And there's some stuff people really just don't care about. <laughs> and so I said, okay, let me make a note of that fact, and other things people do. So the public appetite is something I'm measuring all the time. Next filter is, you're interested in it, but does it lend itself to a visualization for a visual medium, as distinct from radio or print? So that further filters it. And the cosmos is the best of the best of the best. It's the best science conveyed in a way that is most significant to you with a visual splendor that will affect you not only intellectually but emotionally.